Hey everybody, Dr. Hyman here. So I know this is a pretty long video, but I wanna highly encourage everyone to watch it the whole way through, simply because it's gonna pay back big dividends. This is probably the most complicated thing we're gonna do all semester. And this is a nice little uh, walkthrough of how to do DNA subway. Um, the other thing I wanna remind everybody is that in these examples, I'm only gonna analyze one sample, um, but I wanna encourage you guys to remember that you're gonna be analyzing all of your group samples. So, with no further ado, DNA Subway. Um, so just to start off, the first thing is just going to the website itself. Hopefully you guys have done that. I'm just going to Google DNA Subway, and it takes me right to the website. Um, and I've set up an account, so I'm going to log in under my account. The nice part about having your own account is you can keep track of all the projects that you do over time. Alternatively, you can also enter as a guest. The downside to that is you won't be able to save any of the projects that you do. Um, so let me log in. Um, so this is the sort of user interface as you can see that there's a lot of different colored what are called lines today what we're doing is a blue line project so I'm just going to click on this little circle here the or the square here that says determine sequence relationships and this is for the DNA barcode analyses that we're going to be doing um, and so on this screen, you can see a couple of different things. Um, you can select your project type, DNA protein or mitochondrial DNA. We will be working with DNA, but we're working on a specific type of DNA. We're working on a barcoding project. And so there's this other toggle over here under barcoding. And on that, you can select the type of primer sets that you want to use depending on the primers that you used for your project. I'm going to be working today with some COI or some CO1 uh, primers. So we're working with invertebrate data. RBCL is for plants, 16S is for bacteria and some other taxonomic groups. We actually use that for amphibians as well in some of our courses. Um, and ITS is fungi. So these are just the different primer sets that are used for the different taxonomic groups. So you want to make sure that you select the correct one for the taxonomic group or the primer set that you used. So once you pick the appropriate primer set, you're going to upload your trace files. Um, and remember, you want to upload all of the trace files for your entire team. So the way you're going to go about that is select this upload AV1 trace files. Um, but first, you need to know what files you're going to upload. And so you need to go back to Canvas. And you're going to go to that sequencing upload spreadsheet that you used previously where you recorded the actual serial numbers of the tubes you sent off for sequencing. So let's pretend that I'm on team three, and these are my forward and reverse sequences for sample one. These are my forward and reverse samples for sample 1A. These are my forward and reverse reads for sample three. These are my forward and reverse reads for sample four. So basically, these are the samples that I want to download sequences for. So now that I remember what the numbers are, I need to go find those sequences. So if I go back to module 10 in Canvas, there's a link that has DNA sequences. So I'm going to go ahead and select the student DNA sequence files or AB1 files. And basically, all of these AB1 files will be listed there. And I just need to find those AB1 files that are associated with my group. So in this case, once again, it's BKM 138 to BKM 145. So BKM 138 is here. And BKM 145 is here. So I'm just going to hold down the shift button so that I can select all of those simultaneously. Then I'm going to right click and hit the download button. 
and it's downloading all of those files right now. So once again, just to reiterate, I click the top one, I held down the shift button, I hit the bottom one, and then I hit the right click button to download those files. So once I know where all that stuff is downloaded to, I can just click here and figure out that it's in my downloads um, under download drive. So here's all those files. And so now I don't need to open these files. I just want to reiterate, you don't need to open these files. All you need to know is where they downloaded to so that you can upload them to DNA Subway. So if I go to DNA Subway, I hit upload AV1 files. I choose the files that I want to upload. I figure out where those went. I'll click on the top one, hold down my shift key so that all of them are selected. And then I'll hit open. And now I can see that there's eight files selected there. So that means I got all the files that I wanted to select and you can even see them listed right here. Um, you may not have eight files if you didn't send off four samples for sequencing, but you want to make sure that all of your sequence files from all of your group members and all of your samples get uploaded here. Once you've got that in there, then you can enter your project title. So in this case, I'll put in Team 1, Section 1001, Dr. Hyman, and I'm putting put in the description as Fruit fly sequences or whatever your samples are and then I'll hit the continue button to start my project. So here you're looking at uh, the DNA subway line. There's three main stops, assemble sequences, add sequences, analyze sequences, and then in each of these three main stops there are sub-stops, so sequence viewer, sequence trimmer, pair builder, consensus builder, so on and so forth. And so I'm going to walk you through each of these sub-stops, I'm sorry, main stops and the sub-stops. Um, this first main stop is called assemble sequences. And so this is all about sort of cleaning up and visualizing the data that you have to make sure you're putting good stuff in before you actually do any analysis. Um, before I get into that, I just want to draw your attention to this project information down at the bottom here. You can see that there's a formal project ID number that can be useful to help locate a project later on. If you can't remember the number, you can record this stuff, or I'm sorry, the project name, you can record this stuff. You can switch the status to private or public. Sometimes it's nice to have a public project if you want students or other people to be able to observe that project. So you can make it public and you can share the information like the project ID so that they can find it. And you can edit any of this stuff by clicking this edit button right here. Um, so, so the first part is sequence viewer. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the sequence viewer button. And what you can see are my one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different sequences that we have here. Um, the first thing that we can look at is the actual sequences themselves. So this is AGT626, a forward read. Um, and you can see right here the actual sequence. And you can use this little uh, bar to toggle across and look at the entire sequence. Um, one of the things to take note of is at the very beginning of each of these sequences, you can see that there's a bunch of ends. Those ends represent non-calls. So in other words, when the sequencing happened, it wasn't able to figure out if there was an A, T, G, or C at that position in the DNA sequence. And as you can imagine, those ends are not really good for your analysis. They don't add a lot of information. They can gum up the works a little bit. So one thing that we're going to want to do is get rid of all of those ends or trim off all of those ends off of our sequences. And we'll talk about how this software does that or that this software does that in a minute. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is this little icon right here. This will allow you to look at the actual trace file. So when I say a trace file, this is what I'm talking about. These sort of like colored uh, spikes that you see here. This is a trace file image. 
Um, and when you're looking at this trace file, this is about a clean of DNA sequence as you can get. You can see towards the end there, it gets a little bit noisy. But at the very beginning of it, it's a very uh, clean, clear, tall peaks. Um, what those peaks indicate is each color indicates a particular nucleotide base. Okay, so greens represent A's, blacks represent, represent G's, reds represent T's. Um, and so the way the sequencing works is basically you have these fluorophores that put out a particular sort of color. Um, and the machine measures color spikes at a particular point. And when you have a spike in that color at a particular point, um, as the sort of DNA sequence reads through or flows through this reader, that indicates a base pair at that in, in particular position. And so what you're looking at here is the trace file or the sort of brightness and peak of the color of the sort of fluorophore at this position for the sequencing read. Um, you've got this blue line and these purple bars here. You've got these numbers that represent the position in the sequence. So you can see this goes from zero all the way up to about 680, 700. So there's about 700 base pairs that we're looking at here total in this sequence read. Um, and you've also got the actual calls or the letters at each of those points. So I wanna draw your attention to this quality area right here. So the blue line and the purple bars. You can hit this little question mark and that explains what the bars are and what the line is. Um, this is very nice for you and for students if they're having questions to be able to click on this stuff and remind yourself what's going on here. Um, rather than just read that to you, I'm just going to talk you through. So basically, this blue line here represents what's called a FRED score of 20. That's P-H-R-E-D, FRED score of 20. Um, all the FRED score is, without getting into the gory details of it, is an indication of how high quality each individual base call is. When I say a base call, what I'm saying is, this letter that you have in your sequence, it's a base call. It, it was the machine called this a T at that position. And this FRED score tells you how confident can we be that this base call here, this A right here is correct. How confident can we be that this G right here is correct? How confident can we be that this C right here is correct? And that bar, the purple bar right there, indicates the individual FRED score for that individual base pair. Um, so this blue line tells us a FRED score of 20, which gives us 99% confidence that an individual base call is correct. So anytime that this purple bar goes above the blue line, that indicates that we're at least 99% confident that that FRED score or that base call is correct. So all this is, is quality control to make sure that your individual base calls are right. And so you'll see these sequences here have these low quality score alerts. What that indicates is that your sequences, greater than 1% of them have an error rate um, or, yeah, the average error rate for your sequence is greater than 1%. So it means that more than 1% of your base calls don't have a high quality FRED score. And so let's take a look at these sequences that are giving us warnings here. So this is a great example of kind of ugly sequence. You can see very small peaks. You can see that there's lots of places where the peaks overlap with one another. So it's hard to make out what's going on in there. And you can see a lot of the FRED scores are pretty low, well below that blue line. So this is an indicator that you have low quality sequence. And you can also see that there's not a lot of sequence going out past really, or, uh, yeah, really like 270, 280 base pairs. So it's short, small, and garbled uh, trace file. Same deal here. You can see there's just a lot of noise in there. Um, so students will sometimes get these warnings in there. Um, sometimes you'll still be able to analyze the sequences in DNA Subway. So don't feel like you can't use those sequences. You can still analyze the data that you get from those sequences. You just have to take it with a grain of salt, understanding that you can't necessarily trust those sequences. That's the first sort of QC step is just looking at your sequences. The next step is sequence trimmer.
Remember I talked about those ends at the front end and the tail end of each read? These are, this is gonna trim off those ends from both ends. So now you can see there's none of those ends on either end of the sequence. We're starting off with G's, T's, et cetera. And you can also see that this sequence right here got completely trimmed away. So that sequence was so bad that it just disappeared. So now we've got nothing to analyze for this read here. Um, so for the sequence trimmer, let me just show you this sequence again. It's got all the ends on it. You see all those ends there? At the beginning of each sequence, you literally just click this trim button. It takes three seconds, and now you can see there's no ends on that sequence. Like the only thing you do is just click that button and it trims them off. They're cleaned up now. So back to Pair Builder. So our sequences look okay. We got some bad ones. We've trimmed them away. We've taken off the, the no calls or the non calls. And now we're going to start pairing them up. So remember, you have a forward and reverse read. So basically, right now, the computer is only seeing them as forward reads in one direction. And so you need to tell the computer that one's supposed to be going this way and one's supposed to be going the other way. So you have this sort of ability to complementary base pair these two things later on. So that's all you're telling the computer is which direction these things are going in terms of the directionality of DNA. So this one, you can see there's F's and R's right here that I've marked. Um, you may have to keep track of that. It'll depend how you've labeled your samples and everything like that. Um, so you need to have that within your labeling system, which one's going to be the forward, which one's going to be the reverse. Um, so I'm going to mark this one as forward and reverse. All you got to do is just click on these things and it makes them one or the other. Make this one a reverse. And then I'm going to pair these two. Yep. Pair these two. Oops. Yep. Pair these two. Yep. And then I no longer have the ability to pair these two sequences because this sequence is so bad, it got completely trimmed away. So that one, I'm just gonna leave as is. So this is another thing that you have to be really careful about because it's easy to analyze those sequences and you can get data back from it, but you've gotta take it with a strong grain of salt. You can't necessarily trust it because it's not gonna be um, as accurate of data because you can't make a consensus sequence. And we also know that initially this sequence was of low quality in the first place. So you need to be very careful with that. So now I've got all my pairs, everything's paired together, forward and reverse, everything's labeled correctly as forward and reverse. That's pretty key to get, make sure you get the forwards as the forwards and the reverses and the reverses. That'll make a difference in downstream analyses. So make sure you get that stuff right. And now I'm gonna do the consensus builder. So once again, I'm just gonna click on this consensus builder button. It's running the analysis. It's done running the analysis. So now I'm going to open it up. And what we've got is our one, two, three, four different samples. And for each sample, we've got a forward and a reverse read that have been paired together to make what's called a consensus sequence, okay? So essentially what the software is doing is saying, I've got a forward read this direction. I've got a reverse read this direction. Let's combine those two together and see where they align. And then let's make an individual single barcode out of that based just on the forward sequence. So we're gonna flip the reverse sequences over to their complementary base pair to make a single sequence that's called the consensus sequence. And so I'm just gonna show you. So remember the consensus sequence is this bottom one. The forward sequence is the top one. So that's our forward read. And this is our reverse read for our individual sample AGT26. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is scroll across and what you can see is the forward read, the reverse read, and the consensus sequence. And what you wanna see is that all the sequences match up perfectly. You want the reverse read to confirm what the forward read is saying. Those things should match up perfectly. If they're not matching up, what you'll see is this. So here you've got this little highlighted section right here, okay? This highlighted section is saying, in our forward read, we think it's a G. In our reverse read, it's telling us it's an A. So which one do we want to go with, the G or the A? So what you can actually do is click on this region, and it'll show you, look, here's your FRED score for the G, and it's not a really clear peak. It's kind of noisy. Here's your FRED score for the A. It's higher. We're more confident. 
And so what the machine does is it automatically does that comparison for you and it picks the A. And in my experience, 10 times out of 10, the machine will get this right, but you have the ability to go in and supersede what the machine says. So if you say, you know what? I don't really trust that A. I think this should be a G. You can click that and it'll change it to a G for you. Or you can keep it in as an A. So for each of your sequences, what you can go, well, actually, let me go through the rest of the way on this one. Um, so the other thing you can do with this is what's called trim your consensus sequence, okay? So best practices say that these tails, where there's no overlap in the sequence, we can't necessarily trust them because we don't have a double check for those regions. So you'll tend to have a little bit of tail on the reverse end that's not overlapping with the forward read and a little bit of tail on the forward read that's not overlapping with the reverse read. And so these tails you can trim off. So essentially all you do is say, okay, here's where it stops overlapping. Let me click here and it'll trim off everything to the left. And I can go to the other end and say, oh look, this is an overlapping here. I can't be super confident that these are correct. So I'm gonna trim off these areas as well. And it'll show you, okay, here's the length of my consensus sequence, 684 base pairs. I'm trimming 40 base pairs off the left. I'm trimming 26 base pairs off the right. Let's say I do this, oh crap, I trimmed off way too much. Let me hit the reset button so I can click off the right area, okay? So you can hit this reset button to get rid of any of those trims. Um, so ideally, this is sort of like perfect sequence in the sense that there's great agreement between the forward and reverse read. There's these short sort of tails that can be trimmed off. So I'm gonna go ahead and trim this sequence. And so now we have a consensus sequence that's accurate. It's 618 base pairs long. And typically, uh, not always, but oftentimes your consensus sequence can be a little bit longer um, than your individual read. No, I'm sorry, I take that back. It's more accurate than your individual reads. And so you can have more confidence that you have the right data. Um, the other thing that I highly, highly recommend that you do anytime you trim a consequence sequence is edit the name of it. So AGT26 is not super informative, and especially if you've got a bunch of samples that are AGT26, AGV36, K8228, or whatever it is, it starts to get really confusing in downstream analyses, keeping track of all that stuff. So I might change this one to Ollie sample. Uh, moth or something like that. I don't even know if that's a moth or not, but uh, the idea here pair names can only contain letters, numbers. Oh, that's the issue. Um, the idea here is to just name it something that's going to make it a lot easier to keep track of what it is. So you definitely want to do that. So I'm going to go through and just do this for my other samples. This one looks really clean. I'm going to go ahead and trim off this tail, trim off this tail, and call this Let's go to this one. So yeah. You can see this one's getting a little bit hairier in the sense that there's some spots where there's less agreement. Um, there's also spots where you've got dashes. Um, another thing to draw your attention to are the gray areas. If you've got these sort of grayed out sequences like you see right here, well, you can't see it now that it's highlighted, but you can see they're a little bit lighter in color. That just indicates that those are lower score base calls. So if you see gray sequence, you typically want to trust the other darker uh, text sequence. Um, so I'm going to trim this one as well. see. Okay, so we've got all our sequences trimmed uh, and we've got them named. I'm going to go ahead and close out of that. So just to recap, what we've done is we've looked at our sequences, we've trimmed off the ends, we've paired our forward and reverse reads, and now we've built an individual consensus sequence that's the most accurate sequence possible. Um, and that consensus sequence, technically, that is our DNA barcode. So now we have our barcode. We've cleaned up our data and we're ready to start actually analyzing our DNA barcode. So now we're going to go to this next stop called add sequences. So I'm going to hit this thing called blast n. 
Essentially, what BLASTN is, is a Google search for your DNA sequences. So this is automatically dropping your sequences into an NCBI database BLASTN search. BLASTN stands for BLAST nucleotide. Um, oops, close that that. So I'm gonna go and hit this BLASTN thing. What you can see is now I've got my one, two, three, four samples, and I'm just gonna say, go ahead and blast it. It's doing this remotely now, so I can actually just let that run. Go ahead and blast the next one. Let that run. Go. Blast the next one. Let that run. Blast the next one. Let that run. So these are my blast results um, for that sketchy sequence. Remember, for this one, we got to take it with a grain of salt. So let me just run you across what we're looking at here. Um, so first, we're looking at basically this is ordering these based on how good of a match they were in the database. Um, we've got something called the accession number. This is a unique serial number to uh, a unique sample in the NCBI database. So there's multiple samples of the same genus and species, this Castaniera variata. You can see that there's multiple Castaniera variatas, um, but they all have unique accession numbers. So what that means is these are different samples that have had their barcodes entered into this NCBI database. Um, the next thing that you'll see are details about this individual uh, accession number sample, JN, whatever it is. This is the genus and species or the taxonomic information associated with that sample. Um, this is some other uh, sort of information about it. So you're looking at a cytochrome oxidase subunit one. So when we talk about CO1, this is what we're talking about. Um, this is a, a part of the mitochondrial genome that was sampled and sequenced from that organism. Um, the main information that I wanna draw your attention to besides, of course, the taxonomic info. So this is saying this sample is aligning pretty well with this Castaniera variata. Um, actually, let me show you this too. If you click on this, sometimes it'll give you some taxonomic information on that. And you can also just right click on it and say search Google. And it'll show me, oh look, this is a spider. Okay, so we've got a spider. So the main information that's sort of useful to understand how good of a match this is are alignment length, bit score, E score, and number of mismatches. Okay, so alignment length basically tells you how many sequences were aligned or matched up from your barcode with the barcode that's in the DNA database. So this is basically saying you have 196 base pairs that are aligning. As a general rule of thumb, we try to say that if you've got anything less than under about 400 base pairs in your alignment length, you really can't trust that. Mismatches is 10. So this is saying of the 196 base pairs that were aligning, 10 of them mismatch between your sample, your query, and the blast hit, the thing that it aligned with in the database. Um, and there's another general rule of thumb. If your mismatches divided by your alignment length is over one or 2%, you really shouldn't trust that sample to the, the genus level. Most of these things you can be confident in at the genus level if you're around a 99% uh, match or so. Once you get above or below about a 98% match, you need to be very care careful trusting this taxonomic ID um, below, I don't know, the family level or below the genus level. Um, your E-score is basically telling you what's the probability that this match happened just by chance. Um, so the lower that number is, the less likely it is. It's just a random match within the database. And so this is saying that's eight to the times 10 to the negative 84th power that this just happened by chance. So very low probability. And your bit score is essentially an amalgamation of all of those things, your alignment length and your mismatches. And the higher your bit score is, it's basically the longer your alignment length is, the fewer mismatches you have, the higher your bit score is going to go. So a higher bit score is a good thing. You want alignment length to be high, you want bit score to be high, you want E score to be low, you want mismatches to be low. Yeah, so I'm looking at sample number two now, I'm looking at the blast results here. And you can see that uh, there's some that it's saying, we know it's in this genus, Supaphilus, but we don't know what species it is. That's the closest match. Um, and there's some different species that are popping up 
and some are just saying family information. So this sample, we know it's something from this family, but we don't know what the genus or species is. You can see that our alignment length is a bit better for the sample. Bit score is much higher and there's zero mismatches. So this is a much more sort of reliable hit in the sense that we're over 400 base pairs. We've got a bit score above 1,000, which is usually a good sign. Usually above 900, 1,000 is a pretty good sign. And there's zero mismatches in this alignment. So this is something we can be a little bit more confident in. The issue here is it's only telling us the family. So we don't know what the genus or species of this sample was. We only know what family it was in. Let's look at a different sample. So here we've got Longitarsis tibitis, over 400 base pairs again in the alignment length. Bit score is a little bit lower and a huge number of mismatches. So 69 mismatches. So that's a lot of mismatches, which means once again, we can't be super confident that this is a good match. And you can see that there's several different uh, genera that are popping up. So we're even getting members of different genera that are becoming pretty good matches. So this is not a super uh, reliable um, sample. Let me take a look at this one. So in this one, you've got another sort of scenario where every single hit is 600 base pairs, a high bit score, and only one mismatch, and it's all the same organism, same genus and species. And so in this case, we can be pretty confident that this sample is probably Noctua pronuba. So let me just analyze one of these samples, show you what we're going to do. So I'm going to look at Suthophilus gutulosis, this sample number two. I'm going to select data to add to our analyses. So what we're doing here is just saying we want to do some further downstream analyses and we want to compare a couple of these different blast hits. So I'm going to throw this one in here, this one in here, this one in here, this one in here, this one in here. I'm going to skip the ones that are only or ending in spa just because those can confuse things a little bit. Let's see what we've got here. I'll do that one. And then I'm going to hit this add blast hits to project. Um, but I do want to show you reference data. So here you can pick reference data to add to downstream analyses as well. And so this basically lets you put in other organisms that could be closely related that you might want to compare to. So I know that I'm doing insects right now. So I'm going to pick common insects and I'm just going to hit add reference data. And what it's going to do is add all of these different insects from these different orders uh, to, to my downstream analysis. So I'm going to go ahead and hit add reference data. And so now We've done this, so we've gone through, we've blasted our samples. Within this one, I've selected several samples that I want to analyze downstream. Um, and I'll show you what those analyses are in a minute. And then I've included some reference data to include those analyses, that being the common insects. It says already added right here. And so now we're going to start actually analyzing these different sequences. Okay, so for the next part, we're gonna actually analyze those sequences. So I'm gonna do the first sub stop here, select data. Go ahead and click on this. Um, so I'm going to just add my sample two. I'm only gonna analyze that sample right now. I'm not gonna analyze all the other samples um, just because I only wanna do a comparison of that one and the blast hits that I've made so far. Uh, I'm gonna add an out group. Uh, I guess I'll just pick a stonefly. Um, it helps to have some sort of general knowledge about the relationships of your blast hits to the organisms. What you're trying to do here at this point is select an insect or something that you know is going to be less related to your samples than your samples are to each other or their blast hits. Okay, so this will make a little bit more sense in a minute. Um, and it's not the easiest thing to do, um, but if you're at all worried about it, you can just select a couple of these 
um, and you can figure it out from there in downstream analyses. So it'll make a little bit of sense what I'm talking about in a minute. Um, and then I'm gonna add all of my blast hits to this analysis, okay? So I've got my sample that uh, I've blasted, I've got those blast hits, and then I've got this stone fly that I'm gonna add in as a reference uh, sample. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit the Save Selections button. And then I'm gonna pump it into this muscle alignment, okay? So I've selected the data, now I'm saying, let's run an analysis on those data that I've selected using a muscle alignment. So it's done the alignment, now I'm gonna open it up. And this is what's called a muscle alignment. Essentially what you're looking at is all of your sequences um, in a sort of color coded format where the colors represent base pairs all stacked on top of each other. Um, so you can see number five here is Ollie's sample. And then this is the actual DNA sequence for my sample. Um, the gray areas represent areas where there's not any differences between my sample and what's called a consensus between all of these other samples. The first thing you wanna do in any of these alignments is trim them so that you're comparing apples to apples. So you can see that there's these dark gray regions here where the, all the samples or all the sequences are not the same length. We wanna make sure we're comparing everything or the same length uh, across all of these sequences. So I'm gonna hit this button here that says trim alignment and it's going to trim it down so that we're sort of comparing apples to apples here. So trimming, trimming, trimming. Okay. So you can see that there's one, two, three, there's a couple bars here that we're looking at. The first one being sequence conservation. Essentially what that's saying is at this individual region um, in the sequence, is there any variation at that particular spot? So if I'm gonna zoom in and look at this a little bit closer, so you can hit this little button right here that says A, T, C, and G, and that's gonna zoom in on the sequence and show you the actual individual base pair. So all you're doing is zooming in more on this box. So if you look at it here, and you can toggle the whole way across, these are all of our sequences, and you can see the regions where there's variation. So every time you see a letter in there, that's a spot where there's some sort of variation in the sequence at that particular position. So for example, you can see at this position right here, so that maybe this is like the third base pair in the sequence, you can see that the sequence conservation bar goes down. What that tells you is about 55% of the samples have variation from normally there's an A here, but in half of about half the samples, there's a G there instead. So this bar drops down. So this just tells you the amount of variation that's going on in the sequence. Or I'm sorry, the conservation at a particular region. The next bar is sequence variation. So all that tells you is, is there any variation in that region? And if there is variation in that region, how many different base pairs can you see? So for example, at this position, there is variation, but there's only one variant, it's a G. Whereas if we scroll across, you can see here, there's two colors. So the variation from what's normally, so the most common position is a T there. So this consensus sequence tells you what the base pair is at an individual location. The most common is a T, but there's variation that you can also have a C or an A there. So you see the blue and you see the green. That indicates that there's two different variants that you can find at this particular position in the alignment. And then there's this consensus sequence. And all the consensus sequence is, is it tells you this is what the most common uh, nucleotide is at any particular region. And you can see at this region, A is the most common one and there's zero variation there. And so anywhere where the box is just light gray, it just means there's no variation across all the sequences. And so if I zoom back out to this sort of barcode level, so I'm gonna click this button over here that has the barcode in the left corner there, you can see all the variation that we see. And this is nice because some very obvious trends start to emerge. So for example, if you look at my sample, Ollie sample number two, and these Suthophilus gutilosis, just visually, just sort of looking in this region right here, you can see that those just look like there's colors in the same regions. You can see there's variation in the same spot in this blue line here, this blue line here, this black line here. And so that starts to give us sort of a visual representation of what the barcodes look like 
and how similar the barcodes are. And we can see that my sample is aligning pretty well with this Suthophilus gutilosis. Um, not so much with some of these other sequences, especially the stonefly. You can see that that one's way different. And you can actually quantify this by hitting this sequence similarity button. So if you look upper in the upper right hand corner here, there's this button that says sequence similarity. I'm gonna click on that. And what this gives me is just a pair by pair comparison of all the sequences. So for example, I can look at Ollie sample number five. Here's number five right here. And I can see that it's 97% similar to the consensus sequence, 79% similar to the stonefly sample number one. 90% similar to this Udocilla robusta sample number two. And I have the highest similarity, 99.84% similar to sample number six, the Suthophilus butylosis. So 99.8% similar can give us some confidence that that may actually be what the taxonomic identity of the sample is, because there's only a 1% difference between our sample or a less than 1% difference between our sample and that sample. So this is a nice way to actually quantify how similar those sequences are. So now we're going to take the data that's in the muscle alignment and we're going to create some phylogenetic trees using uh, the alignment. So I'm going to go ahead and just click on these buttons. This is phylip NJ, which means neighbor joining tree. So that's the sort of uh, process that's going on on the back end of this is it's using a neighbor joining method to make uh, one type of phylogenetic tree. And this is phylip uh, maximum likelihood. So maximum likelihood is just another method that you can use to make a phylogenetic tree. So these are just two different computational methods that can be used to uh, look at the relationships of these sequences based on their genetic differences from one another. So I'm gonna click this one and it's gonna make the tree. I'm gonna click this one and make the tree. And then I'm gonna pop this open. And so here we're looking at an NJ tree. The very first thing that you wanna do with any of these trees before you start looking at any of the analyses is you wanna make sure that you pick the, collect, the correct out group. Okay, so the out group is always gonna be the one that's the least similar according to that percent sequence similarity on the previous muscle alignment. In this case, it's going to be that stone fly. So all these other things, they're crickets, but that stone fly is not as closely taxonomically related to crickets um, as they are to each other. And so this roots the tree and this says, this is sort of what the baseline difference should be. And so by rooting the tree with this out group, you get a much better built tree. So here we're looking at, now I've got stonefly as the out group. You can see it's highlighted in red there now. In the bottom right corner, it says stonefly plecoptera. We've got the right out group. And now we can look at this tree. Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Um, so you probably, your eyes are initially drawn to these numbers here. Um, all, what the numbers are telling you is basically this uses a bootstrapping method. What that means is it does a whole bunch of iterations where it moves individual things around and sees how many times this tree gets the same shape, the same topology. And what those numbers mean is that percentage of the iterations, it got that exact same relationship, that exact same topology. And so if you've got numbers like 100 and 99 and 100, that means you can have a lot of confidence that this little split right here in the tree is correct. So the way that I would interpret this is that my sample, Ollie sample number two here, its closest relative is this Suthophilus gutilosus. And then it's all within this other clade that's also Suthophilus gutilosus. So this gives me confidence based on the samples that I selected that because they're all this individual clade and because 100% of the iterations are all coming out as the same species, I can have some confidence that this supports that this is potentially that species um, or a member of that species group because it's more closely, that barcode is more closely related or more similar to a member of that species as it is to other members of that species. So the last part I wanna discuss is the ML tree. So if you just click right here on Philip ML, that will pop up your ML tree. And once again, you wanna make sure that you've selected the proper 
out group here. Typically it gets this right, but let's just make sure that this is the appropriate out group. And so the key thing I think to pull from these ML trees is that this horizontal distance that you see in these lines indicates the genetic distance. So the longer that line is, that longer horizontal line means there's a greater genetic distance between those samples. And so like Bruce said, these two samples here, Ollie sample two and Suthophilus gutilosis, these two samples right here, you can see that there's zero horizontal distance between those two. That means they're very, very closely related to each other according to this analysis. And so that gives us some confidence that it could be this species, that taxonomic ID. And further, furthermore, we can see that all the Suthophilus gutilosis, see if I can just highlight that little clade again, it's not letting me do it, but you can see here that this, all of those individuals are coming off in one single clade. So that once again gives us some confidence that this sample is a member of at the very least that genus and potentially it is a member of that species in terms of its sequence variation. So, so now it's your turn. Navigate to module 10 in Canvas. Take a run through the blue line using these practice sequence files and these PowerPoint guides. Take the pre-lab quiz. And then when you come to lab, you're gonna follow the directions in the lab printout to fill out your week 10 DNA Subway lab notebook, which is essentially filling out all of your sequences and analyses into your lab notebook. And lastly, you'll use those analyses to write up your first draft of your project results. Good luck.